Mindset Mashup Podcast, here we are. And have we got a guest today? Um, we've got a SWAT host, um, hostage negotiator, customer service manager, school security consultant, basketball coach, author, Mr. Terry Tucker. And I'm I'm looking forward to this. I'm really excited, Terry. And I mean, just reading out that list, there's such a diverse roles that you've had in your career. And I'm looking forward to breaking down to what you've learned from some of those roles. And I know you're on another venture now with Motivational Check. Um, tell, t- tell us a little bit about that. Sure, so George, first of all, thanks for having me on. I- I'm really excited to talk with you today. Um, yeah, Motivational Check, um, you mentioned I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. And in order to do that, you have to start off, you know, just being a cop, you know, be- going through the police academy, and stuff like that. And when I was in the police academy, the the phrase motivational check was what our defensive tactics instructor gave us as a phrase we could just yell out if we ever thought we were, you know, I can't go on, this is too hard. And and our defensive tactics instructor was a a pretty rough guy. I mean, we ended up running a marathon as part of the academy. We, We did all kinds of things that were physically taxing on our body. So when we got to the point where, you know, I just don't think I could go on, somebody could yell out, hey, you know, motivational check. And the rest of the class would respond with our class number. We were the 84th recruit class in the Cincinnati, Ohio Police Department, just to let that person know, hey, you're not alone. We're, you know, we're all in this together. We're all hurting, but hang in there because together we'll get through that. So when I was looking for a, uh, you know, a title or name, whatever you want to call it for my blog, and, and then my company, I, I thought, well, motivational check would be a, a, a perfect thing to, to call it. And it can go all kinds of different directions from that. So, so I love that. So is it used? Was it used to be like, are you feeling good? Or is it used as more of like a pick me up? Sort of like, Let's go. (laughs) It was really used as a pick me up. I mean, if you were, you know, you were having a tough day, it's like, gosh, you know, I just can't get this right or I can't get through this. You know, I'm kind of down. I need to pick me up. You could yell out the phrase and the rest of the class would respond with our class number to let you know, hey, you're not alone. You know, we're all having a hard day. You know, we're all in, but we're all in this together and we'll get through it together. Don't worry about this being by yourself. We're, We're in this together as a class. I love that. I love that. I feel like that's a nice way. I feel like that's a nice message as well, especially in that sort of environment. I can imagine tough days come quite often um, in those in those sort of environments. But I'd love to know, Terry. Talk us through some of. Okay, have you got any stories from the SWAT, um, from like the the hostage negotiating that you can share on here that like might be useful for anyone listening or, or just interesting? Yeah, I, I I think I can. I mean, I certainly learn things from it. You know, you realize. As a policeman, 99% of what you do involves an interaction with another person face-to-face, whether you're pulling them over to give them a ticket because they're speeding or you know, you're answering a radio run for a fight or a domestic, or whether you're just knocking on their door because you know, the hospital can't get a hold of them because grandmother died and you know, hey, you need to call you know, the hospital. So 99% of what we did was face-to-face, but as negotiators, we weren't face to face with the person, you know, I mean, at best we could be behind the locked door. Sometimes we were blocks away talking to somebody on the phone. And so you had to figure, (coughs) excuse me, you had to figure things out based on what people were saying, what they weren't saying and how they were saying it. And there were a lot of times where, you know, spent hours kind of over here talking about something with, you know, with somebody who's barricaded or with a, you know, a hostage taker, and the real problem was over here. And we hadn't even gotten to that. And yeah. the way I kind of described what we did, we've all, you know, when we were kids, we were all at the park, you know, on the teeter-totter, the seesaw, you know, growing up. And we had fun with it. Kind of the way I describe what we did is like a teeter-totter. So when we started talking to the person, their emotional end was way up in the air and their rational end was down at the gra- on the ground. And over hours of asking them open-ended questions and getting to burn off a lot of that emotional energy, we would kind of bring that teeter-totter to equilibrium. 
And then hopefully over more time, we would have it where the rational end was up in the air and the emotional end was down on the ground. Because we all know we make better decisions when we're using our rational brain versus our, um, our emotional brain. And so, you know, if they're, if they're all charged up and they're, you know, real agitated and they're yelling and screaming, that's not the time to talk about, hey, let the hostage go or put the gun down or come out. That's not the time to do it. So, yeah. you know, you gotta, you gotta just buy time. So that was one thing. And the other, the other couple of things, one was the importance of silence, of how to use silence. I mean, a lot of times in business, you know, we think the, the best salesperson is the person who, you know, th they do the best pitch. They give the best talk. That's not really the best. The best nah. salesperson is the one who listens yeah. the most, who doesn't yeah. do what I'm doing and talking all the time, you know? Yeah. And, and so th that that's one important part. And the other important part of what we did was the importance of trust. You know, I mean, I'm a negotiator. You're a hostage taker. We're building a relationship. There, there's trust there just like there is with a husband and wife or a boss and subordinate or, you know, a, a boss and it's bored or whatever it is, you know, the importance of trust. So we never lied to people. People would say to us, Hey, I'll come out. I'll put the gun down. I'll let the hostage go, but you got to promise me I'm not going to go to jail. And we would have to say, well, when you do come out, you are going to go to jail. And then we would try to deflect the conversation to something more positive. So those are just a few of the things that I think I learned as a negotiator that maybe people can can learn or take away and learn in their business. Uh, I think you, I, I really like what you said there. Um, I, I've been in sales environments and I've been in both B2B, I've been in B2C and something that I quickly, actually that, that's a lot, I didn't quickly uh, learn this at all, was as you said, the ability to listen more than you speak. Uh, because I think in sales that you 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 cover those silent patches, don't you, with words not necessarily relevant to the the conversation or maybe even to the person that you're tr the, the prospect um, of sort. And I think when you begin to listen, it allows you to be able to come up with the right sort of language, terminology. You can uh, also understand what they want, which is the most important part. And I suppose as a negotiator that's quite an important part. You need to understand what they want and see where you are within that. And I think for people, I've said it in many podcasts so far, sales is almost like the the foundation of any business because we all need that. We, we, we all need our clients. And you said, you also mentioned there, Terry, about we make better decisions when we're rational rather than emotional. And I'm, I'm wondering, were you consciously trying to get someone from one state to another or were you allowing them to go through the motions, so to speak? Yes. And yes, uh, I guess to answer your question. I, I, and, and, you know, people always ask us, you know, how did it work? Because the, it, back in the 90, 1990s, there was a movie called The Negotiator and it starred Samuel L. Jackson, you know, a, a big time movie star, you know, where he kind of does everything. And, and that's not, that, no, that's, you know, people are like, well, is that the way it worked? No, that, that's, temp, that's absolutely not the way it worked. So yes, there is one person negotiating, you know, say I'm negotiating with the person who's barricaded. Well, sitting right next to me is another negotiator who's just listening. They're, they're not involved in the conversation. They're just listening and they're passing you notes. And yeah. then there are three or four more negotiators that are kind of out in the crowd, sort of working the crowd, like, why are we here? What happened? So, I mean, the person may have barricaded themselves with a gun and they're threatening suicide because they had a fight with their mother, you know, earlier in the day. Well, you might get a note as the primary negotiator that says, don't talk about his mother. Oh, okay. So, you know, again, that's sort of like being in sales. You've got to understand the dynamic. You've got to yeah. understand the situation and, and, and tailor, as you said, tailor your pitch to that situation because it's not a one size fits all just like it's not a one size fits all when you're negotiating with somebody so it, it really is a team effort and you have to do your homework and you know a lot of times they talk they tell us well you 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 know congratulations you talk somebody out really what we did is we listened somebody out yeah. you know we gave them the opportunity to burn off a lot of that energy by just asking them open-ended questions. And then they talk for a while. And then that's where, here's where the silence comes in. And then there would be this sort of that pregnant pause where it's quiet and nobody's saying anything. 
And you as a human being want to fill that emptiness. You want to fill that space, yeah. but you have to not do that. You have to just be quiet because what's going to happen is they're going to fill it. They're, they're going yeah. to get uncomfortable yeah. with it and they're going to start to talk. So yeah. you, you had to get good at shutting up. And I know that you probably don't think I can do that because I've talked so much, but it really is something, it's, it's, it's a unique gift that you have to develop. It's not something that comes innately uh, easy to any of us. You know, we want to fill that, that dead time, that silence, but you have to use that sometimes to your advantage. And I think you can do that in sales as well. It's uncomfortable. That's yeah. what, it's, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Like if we, if you and I just took like a, a minute pause, it wouldn't just be uncomfortable for us, it'd be uncomfortable for the listeners. And I, I completely understand that. And I, I, it's, I don't know, it's just coming into my mind just now, and I'd be interested to see your thoughts on this, Terry. Um, it says, uh, I think I'm trying to, I'm trying to like visualize the quote. I think it says something like, an average business um, problem solves, but a great business identifies problems before they happen. So like they, 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 then they can fill it. And the way that they do that is by listening to the market. And I think we see that quite often, don't we, when it, when it comes to uh, people that create businesses and are really innovative and they just blow up um, disproportionately because I think they can predict the market because they spend a lot of time listening. Like, I, I think I saw even Warren Buffett was reads like 30 hours a week or something um, every day for a year, then it'll just make one investment. Now, I, for me, it's not all about money, but I just find it interesting how I think we spend a lot of time trying to be proactive and um, like trying to solve people's problems when actually maybe we need to do a little bit more time listening, including, my, I'm including myself in this as well. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, I mean, I've also heard, you know, about some of the, the most influential leaders of our time that one of the words they use the most and you wouldn't think this is no, no, I'm yeah. not going to do that. No, I don't have time for that. No, I don't, because I need to spend my time, as you say, listening, reading, talking to our customers, whatever it is, learning about, you know, can I get ahead of the curve? Can I, you know, whatever yeah. our business is. So, but, you know, when we start out, I mean, we're being pulled in a million different directions. And so, yeah, yeah I'll do that. And yes, I'll go to that conference. And yes, I'll give this talk. And you realize that, there's only so much of you to go around and, and you have to stay physically healthy and you have to stay mentally healthy and you can't keep burning the candle at both ends. So I think, yes, it's important to say no a lot of times. No, I can't do that. Or maybe not say, hey, look, I can't do that. But hey, this person can. They'll go in my place and, and, and they'll be able to take care of it. So you're not really negating it. You're, you're just saying, I'm going to do it a different way. I, I'm going to say no, but this person is going to do it because you do. You need to you need to understand. You need to be constantly reading, constantly innovating. My book is called Sustainable Excellence. And, 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 and it's called that because, you know, a lot of times, you know, whether it's a business or, you know, whether it's a company, whatever you're, you're doing, you know, you want to get to be where you're excellent. But yeah. what happens when we're excellent? Yeah. We, you know, we sit back, we put our feet up on the table, we have a drink, yeah. everything's great. And then six months or a year from now, boom, somebody passes us up because we didn't sustain that excellence. And the only way to sustain it is to do it differently, to find a different way to do it, to get outside yeah. our comfort zones. And so many people are like, hey, I've arrived, I'm good. Well, boom, now, now you're not good anymore. Somebody else is better. Yeah, and I, and I really love, I think sustainable and excellence are probably my favorite two words, actually, I think just period, because I think you're, you're so right, we get to like this, like the, this ultimate point that we're trying to get to. And then, as you said, what, what next? And it, I always use the gym, because I, I just genuinely think the gym is quite a good example of like life, because gym's all about doing things over a consistent amount of time in order to sort of see any progression. But I think that's the same in life, you know, because if you get to a point where you, you're like you're muscly and like you've got to a point where you're happy let's not even use muscles let's just use the word health here whether that is muscles or running a certain amount of distance or rowing whatever it may be it's not once you've got to that point unless you sustain that level of training you're not going to maintain that level of uh, physique or that level of health and i look at that the same in life whenever i'm creating different a routine in my life I always think how sustainable is that for me because that, that's for me what really what everything's about because unless i can sustain it for whatever i like to sustain things for the rest of my life but not everything needs that that level of sustainability 
And always yeah, think about and, ways I can do that. Go on. Go on. And, and, and it's true. And, and, and I think you can even apply that, that example that you just gave about muscles to your mindset. You know, yeah. I mean, if, if you tax, you, you, you know, if you go to the gym, you pick up a 10 pound weight, you do 10 arm curls, and it's not difficult for you, then your muscles never going to grow. Yeah. But if you take that same 10 pound weight, and you do curls until you exhaust that muscle, that's when you break the muscle down. And that's when it can heal and grow and get bigger. Well, that same, that same attitude works with your mindset. If you stress your mind, if you put that, that stress, that, that you know, emphasis on your mindset, then your mind grows, it expands, yeah. it gets outside its comfort yeah. zone. But if you do things that are just comfortable every single day, you're never going to grow. And, and I always recommend, and I try to do this every day, to do one thing that makes you nervous, that makes you uncomfortable, that scares you, that's potentially embarrassing. Because if you do those small things every day, when the big things in life hit, and they hit for all of us, you know, whether you lose yeah, somebody, yeah, or yeah. Your business fails, or, or what, you know, whatever it is, we've all heard the story. If you do those small things every day, you'll be so much more resilient to handle the big things when they come along. Well, it, it's, it compounds, doesn't it? Like, it's impossible not to. Like, so, someone asked me once, oh, George, how, how, how do I overcome fear? And my, my sort of response to that was, well, seek discomfort first. Yeah. Because, as you said, like, if life is coming for all of us. Uh, like, Terry, I know you've got some stories, and I want to come to that later, like things that have gone on with your health. Because I know, mm -hmm. I, from what I've heard, you don't mind speaking about it. And I, I just think it's going to, if it's not health, it's this. If it's not this, it's that. And I think it, like life is always going to come for us. And I don't always think that's that's not always a bad thing because we can learn a lot from the pain. And I know you've got some one of your quotes here that I've actually got down, which I, I really love. It's about embracing the embracing the pain and discomfort, which is on your website. And in fact, we, we could sort of move on to that. Could could you explain that a little bit for people sort of like listening that might be like embrace it? Like why would I embrace that? Yeah, it, it's so counterintuitive to what, you know, our, our minds are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort yeah. and to seek pleasure. So to the brain, to the mind, the status quo, the way things are right now, they're good. They're comfortable. Don't mess with them. Yeah. Leave them alone. But the only way we're going to grow, the only way we're going to improve, the only way we're going to get better is if we step outside those comfort zones. But as soon as we do, our brain starts attacking us by putting all kinds of negative thoughts into our minds. And, and I guess the way I look at pain, <clears throat> regardless whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or mental, whatever it is, is this. We're all going to experience pain in our lives. And for me, you know, I've been dealing with cancer for the last 10 years. It doesn't have to be an illness. I mean, it could be you break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or you know, you don't get the promotion at work that you think you deserve, or you have a fender yeah. bender on the way to work, you know, in your car. Yeah. Pain is inevitable in our lives. Yeah. Suffering, suffering on the other hand, suffering is optional. Suffering is what you do with that pain. Do you take mm. it and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual? Or do you wallow in it and feel sorry for yourself and want others to feel sorry for you? So it's, it's an eight in us. It's, it's inbred in us to avoid pain. But I guess what I'm saying is don't avoid it. Take it, use it, flip it inside, burn it as fuel, use it as energy to make you a more resolute individual. And I think we've seen over and over again, haven't we, that individuals that face pain, individuals that have resilience, that have the ability to bounce back, we see the levels of successes that, that they can reach because, again, it, they have that mindset of growth because it does become a growth mindset when you learn to embrace it. And something I can't help think about when we, we said that is people seek pleasure, but do people enjoy the pain? Do you think like, do you think people maybe not enjoy the pain? Do you think people enjoy the, having the excuse for not becoming something more? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I think we are, at least here in the United States, we, we're, we're, you know, we start down a road toward a goal or, you know, developing a business, whatever that ends up being. And then we come up against an impediment, something blocks us and we quit, we fail, we give up, whatever you want to say. And then we're great at now we got to blame somebody, you know, yeah. we, very few people ever take responsibility 
for their own success and happiness. So we, we come up against this impediment, it blocks us, we quit, and then we wanna blame. You don't wanna blame our mom and dad or our boss or our station mm. in life or whatever that is. We wanna blame somebody. And even when I got cancer, people were like, well, who do you blame? I'm like, well, what do you mean, who do I blame? Well, you gotta blame somebody. It's like, yeah. no, I don't. And then people even got to the point where, well, do you blame God? And I'm like, do I blame God? I'm like, no. I mean, what do you, I don't think God got up on a Tuesday morning, checked his to-do list and said, hey, Terry Tucker, cancer day. I mean, I don't think that happened at wow. all. But I think what God did is gave me the strength to move forward. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't understand why we want to blame. Just take responsibility for your own success and happiness. You know, Mel, Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa, had a great quote, and, and I'm probably going to mess it up a little bit, but it was something like, you know, I, I never lose i either win or i learn mm. and as long as you learn something from you know an obstacle an impediment something in your life as long as you learn something and don't try to blame somebody else you're not a loser you only become a loser even if you lose on the scoreboard you only become a loser when you start blaming other people for the reason you didn't become successful yeah i completely agree with that as well i think it's too easy to do that and i think when we look at some of the greatest you mentioned Mandela. We obviously you've got some other greats there, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, some of the more recent ones, some of the um sort of athletes, uh, LeBron James, um, Ronaldo, they they all take accountability. And I think the part that people don't like about accountability is that you can't just take accountability when you're successful. It's you have to take accountability on both, but people like Oh, yeah. And it was, do you know what? I've witnessed this in sales a lot. Um, if someone had a really high day on sales, they were like, yeah, absolutely smashed it. I'm amazing. Then on the bad days, they'll be like, yeah, the leads weren't that good today. And it's just like, no, you can't do both. You, you have to, you have to, you have to take the good and the bad and you have to be responsible for that because um, there's that saying in business that like, you can't measure what you can't, um, you, you, yeah, you can't measure what you can't manage or the other way around, I might have just butchered that. But, um, and it's, and I think that's the same with how we react in life, you know, like unless we manage both the good and the bad, how, how are we meant to improve it? How are we meant to scale that? But I, I think that's how, we, it goes back to how we think, you know, yeah. and, and a lot of people, and, and I've, you know, I, I'm not gonna say other people do, I've done this. I, I, I think oh, most oh. people do this in their life, is that most people think, with their fears and their insecurities instead of using their minds. It's like, yeah. you know, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that, but oh, what if I fail? What are people gonna say about me? Even though if you know it's good for you to do it, and I always, especially with young people, I always tell young people, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you believe you're supposed to do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Because at the end of your life, the things that you're gonna regret are not gonna be the things you did they're going to be the things you didn't do. And by then it's going to be too late to go back and do it. Yeah. And I think like life is just so precious. Like we don't know when that day is going to come. Um, I thought I was going to sneeze. Sorry, Terry. Um, That's okay. <laughs> so yeah, we don't know when that day is going to come. And as you said, like you don't want to leave any stones unturned. You want to just, at least I, I think, even if you give it a go, you know something like you, you've learned something, you tried something. And for yeah, me, that's and, what it's all about. And who cares what other people think? Yeah, you know, we're, we're so hung up on, you know, hey, it's all about me, but I really care what that person thinks. Wait, yeah. wait a minute. Those two don't seem to go together. It, it's like, if it's all about you, then why do you care what they think? And, yeah. and, and at the end of your life, you're not going to be judged on what other people said or what other people did. You're going to be judged on what you said and what you did. So stop worrying about, oh, you know, what are, are they going to laugh at me? Are they going to, you know, and again, it goes back to when I said earlier, do one thing that makes you nervous, that makes you uncomfortable, that scares you, that is potentially embarrassing. Because if you do those things every day, then when people do laugh at you, when people do say, oh, that guy's a loser, or he doesn't know what he's talking about. You're like, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. You can say whatever you want, because I'm the one out here doing it. You know, yeah. don't try to convince yourself that you're playing in the game when you're sitting on the sidelines yeah. and watching. Do, do you know what, what you just said has come up in pretty much every single podcast about not listening to the sideline? Um, because it, I think we did just get caught up. And I, I think do, as, as I've grown and as I've developed in myself, I can't help but feel when I was listening to the voices of other people, it wasn't the fact that I care what they thought 
I didn't value my opinion enough to dismiss what they thought about me. And and I, I've only figured that out recently, to be honest, because now I'm at a point where I don't care who's judging me, not because I don't care. It's because I just value my own beliefs and my own attitudes and my, what I say to myself more than what, what other people do about me. Because as you said, there, there's something in me that I'm not going to just let that, I'm not going to let that steer me off because why would I? <laughs> because then I'm, then I'm, then I'm in their game and then I'm on, I'm on their sideline almost. And I want to be in my yeah. game, you know? And, and why um, are you letting them rent space in your head? Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. really, I mean, why are you letting them do that? I, I mean, I understand that there are, you know, certain people that, Hey, I like that quality in that person, or, you know, I like the way that person makes a presentation or makes a sales pitch or started his company or something. Great. Then, you know, then take that, that little piece of what they are and incorporate it into yourself. I mean, why do we want to be like other people? There's never been anybody as unique as George, as unique as Terry, as unique as, as your listener. There's never been anybody like us. There never will be anybody like us. So why are we trying to fit ourselves into somebody else's mold? And especially, yeah. why are we letting those people rent space in our brain? Hey, I, I don't have enough space in my brain for my own stuff. Yeah, me, why am I letting somebody else in there as well? Me too. Me, me too. I, I'm the same and I feel that. So, yeah, so I want to just before sort of like we begin to wrap this up, I just want to talk about, I, I know you spoke about your cancer at the beginning. I've heard other podcasts and um, you've listened to it. And I think that's one of the things that when, when you hear something like that, I can only imagine Terry, the emotions and everything that comes with just hearing things like that. And I'm interested because you're still facing it. And what just, I'm completely admire you because you still get up you still do and you, you've got the reasons not to i'm just wondering what what really keeps you you going like what what what's cancer taught you almost oh it's taught me a ton of things i i i don't think you really realize what you're capable of until you face some type of adversity in your life and it doesn't have to be you know an, an I illness know. you know to yourself and i mean you could you know break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend you're really, like i mean there's all kinds of things that can happen in life but it, it certainly lets you figure out how much farther you can go. I mean, one of the things that's got me through this is what I call my four truths. And, and I'll give those to you real quick. They're one sentence. I have them on a post-it note here in my office. And I see them multiple times every day. So they constantly get reinforced mm. in my mind. The first one is you need to control your mind or your mind is going to control you. The second one, you and I talked about this already. Use the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and take that pain and difficulty and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual. The third one is more of a legacy truth. I think it's important for all of us to sort of look at the end game of our lives. And it's this, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. Mm. That's again, your legacy. What is your legacy going to be? What do you want people to say about you at your funeral? And then the fourth one is as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And so I, those things are, I mean, they're the bedrock of my soul. They're a good place for me to kind of a build a life off of. And the other three things I call my three Fs, they're faith, family, and friends. And those things have got me through these 10 year, this 10 year battle of cancer where I've had my foot amputated. I've had my leg amputated. Like, as you mentioned, I'm still being treated for tumors in my lungs. And, and I remember back when I graduated from college, my dad was dying of cancer and and I think his purpose in life was real estate. He, he loved being in real estate. He did it his entire life. And he worked up till two weeks before he died. And he was diagnosed with end-stage breast cancer, which back in the 1980s, they didn't know how to treat in yeah. a male. And he lived three and a half years. And I think he lived because he had a purpose. Mm. As long as you got a purpose in life, I don't care what's going on with your physical body. You know, I've always said, I had a nurse ask me what it was like to have my leg and my foot amputated. And I said, you know, it, it has not been easy and it certainly has not been. But what I told her was cancer can take all my physical faculties, but cancer can't touch my mind. It can't touch my heart and it can't touch my soul. And that's who we really are. This is just a house or a vessel yeah. or whatever you want to call it to, to house that. So don't get all excited about your, your body. Think about your mind, your heart and your soul, because that's really who you are. Yeah. And how, how does someone connect? 
how does one connect to that? Because I can't help Terry. Sometimes, like one thing that I've learned is that people to sometimes to change or to figure out who they really are and what's really capable, they reach, they have to reach like a a huge pain point, and I don't think that's necessary. And I'd, I'd love to stop someone reaching that before they have that change. I'd love to, and I hopefully things like this do that. So how how would you? What would you say to someone before they reach that? that that place to be able to change how can they connect with this that's a that's a great question and and i don't know if i have the answer to that i i one of the other jobs i had as a police officer was i was a an undercover drug cop uh, you know i bought drugs and, and and things like that and i actually did a podcast with uh, with two cadets at the united states air force academy and they asked me you know are there services available for people who are facing addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever. And I said, yeah, there, there's all kinds of services out there. But my comment to them was, unfortunately, we don't change. And, and you hit the nail right on the head with what you said. We don't change until we hit rock bottom, until we get to that point where, you know, we're selling our bodies because we need, you know, a, a $20 hit of crack cocaine because we can't function otherwise. And, and there's, a, there's a very fine line, and this is what I told, there's a very fine line between rock bottom and dead. And so I, I, I don't know if I have the answer to that. I, I can't make you do anything you don't want to do. You can't make me yeah. do anything I don't want to do. So you have to get to that pain point, to that point where you're almost dead before you can sort of rise like a phoenix out of the ashes and say, you know what, now I'm going to change. I'm going to make a difference. Unfortunately, so many people... Don't. They, they don't they don't get to do that they don't, and, they don't make and that's what makes me that. sad that's what makes me sad man it's like that's why i'd love to try and catch because some people bounce back and some people can't and i'd love to i'd love to think that maybe one day we can catch someone before they do that you know and i just wondering if you had any tips on that and i think you're right by the way what you said about purpose I, I completely agree with i've been a man without purpose and i've been a man with purpose and without it it did leave it, it led me down the path of addiction you know that's where it led me and crime and things like that so i i know i know how that feels i'm familiar with that and i know purpose is definitely a game changer and i say to people if you don't know what your purpose is your purpose is to find your purpose <laughs> um it is but that's just it if, if you find your purpose in life and, and i think that's what that's what your life should be about, finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth, using your unique gifts and talents and living that reason. And if you do that, your life, you know, I always say to people, if you do that, at the end of your life, I'm going to promise you two things. One, you're going to be a whole lot happier. And two, you're going to have a whole lot more peace in your heart. But so many people don't do that. They can't find the courage to step outside their comfort zones and find the reason that they were put on the face of this earth. But that's what it is. Courage. That is what it is because it isn't easy. And it's, I mean, even what you're going through with their health, I just think there's so much courage and there's so much there, which just, it's just inspiring. But there's something heartwarming. And it's just, and courage is, I think there's a whole different thing, isn't it? Courage, like just being like stepping out and going, do you know what? No matter what, I'm going to keep going. Like I'm going to keep getting back up. Um, Terry, as we bring this to a close, What would you say if someone was listening to this? Something practical about how they can begin to change their mindset. What 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 would you say to them if they were sitting with us right now? I, I guess I, I'd say I tell them what I learned, and I had I was fortunate to have started playing team sports when I was nine years old and played all the way up through college through till I graduated from college. And one of the things team sports taught, taught me was the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You realize as part of a team and, you know, whether you're a, a team of one starting your business or whether, you know, you're, you're 10 years into this and you got a whole team around you, that if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. And, mm -hmm. and the way I look at my treatments right now is, and I think this is important, and, and, and we, I don't think a lot of people think about this. How do you look at going to work, for example, 
do you look at going to work as I have to go to work or I get to go to work? You know, for me, going to treatment, you know, shaking, throwing up, having a fever, all that kind of stuff. I look at it as, as I get to do that. And people are like, you're nuts. You know, you're, you're an idiot. I mean, no, nobody would do that. But the way I look at it is I get to do this because maybe five years from now or 10 years from now, the doctors will take the information that they learned from me and they'll develop a drug that'll save somebody else's life. I won't even be here, probably be long gone by the time that happens, but I get to go every day. So in the hope that I'm being part of something that's bigger than me, and that this drug is developed in somebody's life gets saved, as opposed to, oh, yeah, I have to go to treatment. It's going to be ugly. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. Do you have to do it or do you get to do it? It's all how you look at life. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's a good takeaway. What are the things? How do you look at the things that you do on a daily basis? Is I think it's a good start. Um, Terry, I'm going to bring this to a close. I just want to say to anyone that's watching, just thanks for joining Terry, Terry and I. Uh, what I love about this content is that this is there for life way past myself, way past Terry, and it's just going to outlive us. And I hope whenever you're watching this, wherever you're watching this, that what Terry said today is just enough just to make you think about some of the things that are going on in your life and how you can change that. Because what I can say, if you're listening to this, I know you've got the hunger, I know you've got the motivation to change, and you can do it. And Terry and I both believe that. And don't forget to subscribe whenever this is that just that's just a funny little comment I thought I mentioned and just yeah if you're still here god bless you all uh we'll see you next time Terry thanks for coming god bless you thank you George